Gamers on Games is sponsored in part by Hi folks, uh, my name is John Gibbons and welcome to another edition of the EtherCon podcast. EtherCon coming up in the weekend in November 2014. I have with me Chris Birch from um, Modifius. I hope that's the way I'm pronouncing it right, Chris. Modifius yeah, Games. Right. He's here to have a quick chat around um, his uh, latest Kickstarter achievement, uh, Mutant Chronicles, and we'll have some chat about uh, other products that he has is, um, selling at the moment on his website and any future sort of projects in the works. So, Chris, nice to meet you. Thanks a lot. Uh, just uh, quickly tell us about yourself, your background, how you got into gaming, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I uh, discovered Ogre, Steve Jackson's Ogre game, uh, the little uh, Ziploc um, hex war game, in a knitting shop with my mum <laughs> when I was about eight years old, and um, spent the weekend at her sister's cattery trying to get my head around ratio combat. But that kind of got me into like what you call fantasy games back in the day. Um, got introduced by my brother to Dungeons and Dragons and uh, with his, his sort of friends gaming group who were all like kind of in their late teens, 18, 19, and um, obviously got sold on that and then grew into Metamorph Metamorphosis Alpha and Star Frontiers and um, became a war gamer. I was playing a lot of war games at home, I taught my brother how to play Napoleonics in 15 mil. And um, because we'd moved just out of town and so I'd, um, I didn't often have a lot of people who were gamers around me. So I ended up writing a lot of rules how to um, play solo war games and just writing endless ideas for role playing games on my own. And uh, ended up running the gaming society at college. And, um, eventually started writing a lot of ideas with a, a, a mate of mine who I met in London when I moved here to work in the music industry. And uh, we ended up, you know, working on ideas till, you know, late at night on dark coke and pizza coming up with uh, all kinds of math um, and games. And, uh, and, and I didn't really um, get into the industry until about eight years ago. And uh, I had, um, I'd been out of games for a while and I came back and I, was, I had a t-shirt company and we were licensing these old uh, comics from a, a British uh, or a Scottish um, publisher called DC Thompson. And these comics are called Starblazer. And um, we were going to, we were doing some artwork of the t-shirts and I said to the guys at Cubicle 7, this would make a great role-playing game because there's loads of really cool artwork. And they said, why don't you write it? So I did. And uh, that was a bit of a mad, painful experience over about four years. But we eventually got it out in 2008 and um, really enjoyed it. And, you know, it was draining, but um, got, you know, gave me the first taste for it. And, uh, and then we did Legends of Anglaire with Sarah Neaton, uh, a load of other very good writers. Um, and then I, um, I, I was kind of looking to do something different than t-shirts uh, in the last uh, few years. I've been doing t-shirts for about 13 years up until last spring. And um, started uh, a year ago, actually two years ago, started working on the idea of Modiphius and doing some you know, adventures for Call of Cthulhu under the name Acton Cthulhu like little standalone releases. Obviously, people will know the Zero Point Adventures by Sarah Newton. And they just took off, did really, really well. And it became this world that, you know, we were growing and growing. And um, as soon as Kickstarter launched in the UK, I jumped on it and thought, well, let's do a Kickstarter. And I thought at the time I was thinking, you know, we'll raise enough money for the core book and I'll just build this little fun evening business. And of course, it was a spectacular success. And we um, we funded uh, 11 books and uh, it, you know, it was uh, mental, you know, the amount of stuff we produced. So, you know, we're still working on that and, and then, um, uh, and then won the rights to Mutant Chronicles as well. Kind of it's, 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 it's amazing the, the, the way that people see, do you do this full time now? Is this, is this your full time job? Are you still, yeah. are you still doing the <laughs> I thought about trying to do both because yeah. I would have made more money. Um, I just realized that I couldn't, uh, I couldn't do the games, um, you know, the Kickstarter justice if I didn't go full time because there was such a vast amount of work to do. 
And I just thought, you know what, we've got the opportunity. Let's let's dive in and and try and do it and um, um, keep our costs down and and um, and work hard. And it's paid off. You know, we've got a great team around us, and we've been able to, you know, we're finally going on sale with Acting Cthulhu next week. Taken really? over here to get the the first two books actually into shops um, because we, you know, we shipped at Christmas. And um, because of the way distribution works, you've got to get stock to uh, the distributors and, you know, line it up and get the right slot in, in um, distribution. So, uh, you know, so it's taken a while. And, uh, and as a result, you know, we've been, uh, you know, um, we've not been able to sort of sell anything until then really, apart from our, you know, our PDF. So, um, you know, it's been, uh, been, it's been fantastic to finally actually get stuff into shops and see, um, see how it goes. So we'll be well, eagerly awaiting a Very brave move um, to, to sort of approach a Kickstarter from the UK end. I mean, I'm, I'm currently about halfway through a Kickstarter, which I was the artist for. And, 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 and there was a time when I was tempted to sort of do it from the, the UK, using UK currency, etc. But, you know, I just didn't think at the time that there'd be the actual power base of support behind because, it's, you know, it's an American, it's an American concept. And I was concerned yeah. about the shipping costs of the books because you think to yourself, well, maybe 90% of the, of, the, of the backers are going to be over in the States. You know what I mean? So but looking at your Kickstarter, I mean, it's hugely successful. I mean, compared to the actual yeah. initial people you wanted, I mean, it's ridiculous the amount of, uh, amount of you know, funds that it's raised. Have you got some concerns about that, about the fact that, you know, a lot of the people there could be from America and there's a lot of these shipping ideas? And well, we, um, we actually, I was worried about it as well, and I thought, we, we did a lot of surveys with people and we said, look, are you in America or where are you in the world? Um, do you understand pounds <laughs> or um, yeah. does that, is that going to put you off? Um, is it confusing? And there was a little bit of a little bit of it, but actually most people seemed OK. And out of our 1977 backers, 800 were American and 400 were British. Yeah. So uh, and then we, we managed to get a very good warehouse in the UK that had great shipping rates, and we absorbed a bit of the cost of shipping to America, saved yeah. a bit, you know, um, wasn't as expensive in the UK. Um, we were basically doing it at cost. And um, and I was very careful to, um, you know, not cut corners on the shipping to the rest of the world, because I know there's a lot of Kickstarters have been caught out by thinking, oh, it can't be that expensive to ship to Australia, can it? And of course, it's terrifically expensive. So we managed to get pretty good rates and um, to offer the same, you know, shipping prices to America as well as the UK, and that paid off. And uh, so we didn't. So here's a question for you then: Mutant Chronicles. Now, you know, I've heard about it because the, the concept has been out there, and, and it's, was it like a first edition out many years ago? Was it something? Was it like um, something? What? Yeah. That's right. So um, it was. I mean, it was like the competitor to Games Workshop in the nineties. You had. Yeah. Um, uh, two video games, Sega and SNES. You had um, uh, three board games, the massive Doom Trooper card game, a line of comics by Simon Bisley. You had three novels. You had uh, two editions of the role-playing game with um, about a dozen supplements. You had the massive Warzone miniatures game and um, TV advertising. It was really, 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 really big. And um, it was I think one of the reasons it kind of collapsed at the end was that the, uh, I think the parent company that did all kinds of stuff in Sweden, you know, from selling kitchen sinks to um, boxes went bust. And I think, and I think part of the issue in, in uh, Sweden is it kind of takes all the, all the uh, subsidiaries with it. And even though Target Games was a huge success, it, you know, it um, struggled with that. So, um, you know, but even so we had, Thousands of people contact us and sign up to our database when we announced that we were doing Mutant Chronicles, and and it, there were people still playing the original rules from over ten years ago in Spain and, and Poland and Sweden and America, and um, it shows that um, uh, you know that there was a, a huge interest. And of course, there was a big movie that a lot of the fans hate, um, but it's still a Hollywood film, and it's still a lot better than any of the Dungeons and Dragons films, <laughs> which isn't very hard, to be honest. But um, so that brought a lot of people 
to the world of Newton Chronicles, who then discovered that there were games and Fancy Flight did a board game. So it's it's um, it's had this very um, you know big 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 fan base. You know, it's a bit like imagine Games Workshop disappeared ten years ago and then had a movie, and um, that's the sort of audience you're kind of tapping into. So it was really fantastic. And I think you know what drew me to it was that I loved the style because it was big shoulder pads, big shoulder pads and big guns. It's yeah, that very it's kind really of slight sci-fi, and um, but it's very diesel punk, which is really like um, what we'd say in the fashion world is on trend right now. Uh, and uh, we're still bollocks, really. But basically, um, you know, there's a lot of cool diesel punk imagery appearing everywhere, and it's that style, that Paul Bonnet artwork that the Asian Chronicles are famous for, um, just still looks cool. It still looks amazing, and we're using that for a lot of the covers. We're getting new art uh, done, and uh, so we've got a real sort of fantastic lineup of artists involved, and uh, so we're kind of using old and new artwork. I think, I mean, and that's what that's what needed to me to Mutant Chronicles is, is Paul Bonner's art because he has got a very, very distinct style, you know. He, and and when, I mean, I had a look on your website and I've looked at the Kickstarter and all of, obviously there's a lot of Paul Bonner artwork there. So so if I'm right then, so what you're doing is you've, you've utilised a lot of the older pieces that were done for the the second edition and, and the other stuff beforehand. So yeah. is that, that must have yeah. saved you a lot of money commercially to do that. I mean, obviously oh. to get Paul Bonner to, to create... 20 colour artworks for you it will be oh, a yeah. lot of money oh a lot of money yeah i mean he's you know he's doing other stuff now he didn't want to do any new ones but um uh obviously all the original books had tons of black and white art inside and not all of that or you know some of it is dated some of it looks great like peter birdting's art who's one of the other major swedish artists he's classic sort of um very sort of um sort of serious slightly twisted black and white art still looks really cool. But in a colour, glossy, hardback, you need to consider how you use that because we've got so many um, great colour artists that are working on it that are bringing aspects of the world to life. So what we're doing is we're colouring some of the old artwork where it, where it would suit it. Uh, or we're using the old black and white art in um, what might look like a newspaper clipping or a fax report or uh so we're kind of using it in in a context that makes sense but trying to make the most of the you know the color um opportunity we've got because it'd be a shame to fill a big color glossy book with loads of black and white artwork and uh, and, and there's so much in the world that's not been drawn before like they didn't draw spaceships they didn't draw a lot of the cities they didn't you know draw all kinds of the of life in the music comedy as well which is what we're doing now so who have you got doing the art directing? Because obviously something like Newton Chronicles, which has got historical fan base from the movies and the books, it's got a certain style to it. Yeah. So, you know, have you got an art director to director keeping all the artists in rain and in check? That's me. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I've been doing art directing for, uh, God, probably 20 years now at three various jobs from designing, overseeing flyers for big rave parties to um, uh, the t-shirt label, the fashion label as part of doing all the, you know, the uh, art direction and for the, um, all the, all our marketing. And, and so I've done uh, Music Chronicles and Acting Cthulhu now. And with uh, Acting Cthulhu, it's a bit easier because I have one main artist who does all our work and he's spot on and he knows exactly what I like. And I don't have to brief him much. He just goes off and comes up with really cool, uh, images. Relationship from, from a publisher and artist point of view. I mean, some of the art I've done, there's a couple of companies I work for where they're, they're very much like that, where they trust you to make your own judgment and they know you can produce the goods. So you don't have a lot of constraint from a, as an artist, which is a bonus, isn't it? Yeah, no, that's right, yeah. And uh, you know, we've, we've brought together a few people. Um, there's a guy called Cloud um, or Christian Quino, who's from the Philippines. He's, uh, he's just moved to um, Hungary. Um, just looking at my list. Uh, Jeff Porter, who's very good, he's been doing a lot of the character concepts. Um, there's a guy called Tommy Arnold, who we're about to get doing some stuff. Uh, Jared Blando, who does a lot of kind of very ornate, old looking style um, weathered maps. He's doing huge, a huge map of Lunar City for us. Johan Fredriksson, um, who's a Swedish um, artist who was working on Cold and Dark. 
and uh, he's a mad fan of Music Chronicles. And, and there's more people we're adding over time. It's because it's got such a history. I mean, you, like you say, a lot of the artists and probably some of the writing people, they must be all fans of the system, so it's probably a little bit of a labour of love, I would have thought, as well. Um, yeah, um, it's a lot of them are, you know, it, that's the funny thing is most people, a lot of the writers who, who've joined the team are people who are like, oh, wow, I remember this from, you know, years ago when, um, you know, they, they were playing it or reading it. And it, so it's got a lot of, uh, it, it was one of those things, people either were like, oh, wow, that's amazing, or eh, not really bothered. And you want the people who are like, oh, wow, I can't wait to work on this, because they kind of get really inspired and, and mm -hmm. um, get excited by it. Well, okay, I mean, be before we quickly move on to, to, to some other stuff, the Kickstarter is now completed for Mutant Chronicles, the third edition, okay? However, if someone like myself who may have missed out on the Kickstarter, how do I get my hands on that book? What's the way I get, well, how do I do that? You can join the Kickstarter, actually, because we've got an open window until kind of uh, middle of May. Right, so you okay. just go to the site, to the Mutant Chronicles page, and you can um, click on a little backer kit plug in there and select your pledge level and join in. It's easy as that. All the amazing deal. I mean, we, for £40, you're getting over, I think, about 2,500 pages of, of books, about 17 yeah. books. <laughs> you've, got a lot, you've got lots of goodies as well, I know. It's all, you know. There's lots of things, marketing stuff going on there, and there's all kinds of products, yeah. isn't there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we did like some ni a nice bag and uh, uh, branded dice, which we're hopefully about to upgrade to Key Workshop dice. And nice. um, you know, t-shirts of all. Of course, had to do some t-shirts of all the um, old Imperial um, Capital and Brotherhood logos. Mm -hmm. We've done some mm -hmm. nice interpretations of that. And um, so, it's, yeah, it's been a really. But it's always a fun process. And funny enough, people always say, "Oh, be careful! Don't do." All complicated stuff like you know all the dice and t-shirts and, and bits and pieces because that that's a real nightmare to do but funnily enough for me it's really easy because that's what I've been doing for the last 13 years is big ranges of merchandise so that's actually the easiest part you get that finished you know it's you know you know the suppliers you get the design you book the products and you get it ordered um, the company is getting really cool Good art, good writers, editing, layout, it's just, you know, it takes a long time. So you've, we've, we've, talked, we've, we've talked about um, Acton Cthulhu, you know, and, and you know, the Cthulhu mythos, I mean, it's something that's always amazed me. I mean, you know, when, when you think of this, this, this guy who wrote these books, you know, nearly a century ago or whatever, and it's amazing how this entire mythos of it is still hugely popular today. You know, it's never died called Cthulhu. So, you know, I mean, even shows like, I don't know if you've seen True Detective, um, but, you know, the, the new Hope show, but there's even elements of, of the Cthulhu mythos going on in the right and there in the background somewhat. So, yeah. what, what's, what's, yeah. what is Acton Cthulhu? You know, what, what is that compared to, say, your normal call of Cthulhu? Well, it's, um, <laughs> it's a couple of things, really. It's, obviously, the, the main gist is you are allied agents or civilians in World War II fighting the mythos and the Nazis who are messing with the mythos. Um, and you've got two main organizations on the uh, Nazi side, the Black Sun and Nachtwolf, who are two rival Nazi uh, groups who are doing various things uh, in connection with the mythos. And you have uh, Section M, and uh, uh, which is a British secret organization, and Majestic, who are obviously the American organization, who are all working to uh, to foil the Nazi plans. And it's obviously we've started it for Call of Cthulhu and Savage Worlds, so you can play it very dark. And the uh, people say it's quite pulp, but when you look at the books, and if you've read some of the reviews, you'll see that actually they're very historically correct. They have enormous amounts of background information. Um, this isn't um, a book, you know, that is wall-to-wall -wall Nazi um, modified apes and um, flying zeppelins and um, Nazi flying saucers. It's a book about playing soldiers and investigators in the 1930s and 1940s. 
uh, and that's the investigator's guide. The keeper's guide gives you all the background as a keeper to back that up and adds in the acting Cthulhu layer of Cthulhu mythos uh, into the war. So we've basically um, given people this entire setting to be able to play very straight, dark, I mean, you could just play a World War II role-playing game if you wanted to, but you can play very straight, Call of Cthulhu, dark, twisted adventures. Um, or you've got the, the Savage World rules, and which is obviously much more pulp, much more, you know, uh, two guns blazing, jump right in, and that lets you play much more pulpy, fun adventures. And our campaigns that are coming out um, stretch from, you know, the sort of uh, more moody, darker, twisted adventures to the outlandish, crazy pulp uh, uh, investigations. So um, it's quite a variety. And it also is set up to let you play frontline adventures as well as investigations in Scotland or London or New York. You know, you don't have to be on the front line. There's a whole world of adventure, and we're, we are gradually building this world up. Uh, and there's a kind of epic conclusion to the story as well, which is uh, going to happen with the Assault on the Mountains of Madness campaign, so which is obviously okay. going back to the Beyond the Mountains of Madness storyline. I mean, I'm just, looking, I'm just looking at the products now on your web page, and the first thing that catches my eye is the figures are absolutely beautiful. The miniatures oh. are, I mean, I'm just looking at one here, Sergeant Brandon Carter. I mean, that, the, the amount of character that's been built into that figure is is awesome. Yeah. So are these, yeah, are these yeah. miniatures going to be uh, for the role playing game, or is it kind of like a, is, is is the potential there for like a skirmish style battle game as well? I mean, what's yeah. you know? Is it... Well, in fact, we um, if you know Spartan Games, that yeah. that make the Firestorm Armada um, fleet battle game and dystopian wars and dystopian legions. They are producing the Acton Cthulhu skirmish game with us. So right. we um, we started off with these 49 miniatures that we funded through the Kickstarter. And they're on sale um, as sets, and we're also launching them as, as sets of three figures um, next month. And uh, they'll be available through the summer up until around about August when we swap over to Spartan. And then Spartan will take over doing really nice box sets of um, specific uh, Nazis, villains, allied investigators, creatures, and then we're going to do a big starter set and a uh, whole rule system to let you play proper skirmish games uh, with oh, these no. figures. And of course, you'll be able to use your existing World War II 28 mil miniatures. They're, they're scaled to work with existing miniatures. So. Right. Yeah, your concept art is lovely. It must admit, you know, 10 out of 10 for your artists you've got there working on the concepts for the miniatures, uh, Chris. You know, they've really got to put some nice characterization all of the um, all the figures that I can see. Uh, again, guys, anyone listening, if you want to have a look at this, just head over to the uh, Modifius um, Entertainment website. Uh, nicely put together website uh, that's got some interesting little tabs. You can pop down to the various different uh, game systems that this, this, uh, this team of guys produce. Uh, and again, yeah, like I say, some lovely concept piece and some lovely artwork that's in there. So, as well as um, as well as Acton Cthulhu, you've also you look like you're pushing out into this range of Dust. Now, now I remember Dust as being some kind of skirmisher type board game, um, and again, very much in that kind of strange sort of World War Two with a little bit of sort of technology and supernatural stuff going on. I mean, is that right? Is that is that the concept? Am I am I right with that? <laughs> War II with uh, alien technology. So they end up with um, big walkers and plasma guns and all kinds of stuff. And it's kind of funny how we started. Um, I I'm, I was playing the Dust Tactics um, board game, which is, if you don't know, it's, um, it's uh, distributed by Battlefront. Uh, you get these awesome uh, pre-coloured sort of blue and green figures, beautiful uh, pre-assembled uh, kind of designer figurines and big walkers, and uh, it's a, it's a kind of uh, boxed uh, tactical skirmish game uh, played across boards and tiles, and then you can also play a kind of normal war game with it with a sort of different set of rules. So um, I got in touch with Paolo Parente, who's the designer of the system, and um, 
who people will, will know from uh, AT43. And um, he uh, turns out he loved Acting Cthulhu. And uh, I said, oh, look, you know, fancy doing a crossover with Acting Cthulhu. So we're doing a, we funded a crossover adventure book where you get to, you get the stats for stuff, tactics, characters in Call of Cthulhu and Savage Worlds. And you get to play a role-playing adventure where your characters meet them on another alien world. You get, you know, tossed into another dimension through the big, some big ceremony. So you get to, to kind of have the hook up that way, but you can also play the same game using the Dust Tactics rules. So you can play it as like mini missions. So it's a good little crossover. So it's just been released, so is that something which you're looking to do a Kickstarter for, or is that a separate entity? Well, the, the crossover book, the, just the sort of uh, little mini adventure book, is coming out as part of the Act and Cthulhu range. So that will be out in June. And um, but then we got talking, I said, well, have you thought about doing a role-playing game um, for Dust? And he said, well, yeah, but we know, we haven't got anyone to do it. And I said, well, we'd love to do it. <laughs> and um, so we ended up signing a deal to do the official um, Dust uh, tactics, or what's called Dust Adventures, the role-playing game. And that will let you um, create characters in the universe, use all the figures, that are available for the game, and there's a vast range of miniatures, and um, the uh, um, you'll be able to play some battles in the campaign using the Dust Tactics rules, and or just play through as a role-playing game. So it it meshes really nicely with their existing release plan, and so we're doing a Kickstarter in probably August once we've delivered the Mutant Chronicles book, and. Um, that will be to fund the core book and some new miniatures like kind of heroes and villains for the dust range. And uh, so we'll be work we're working closely with Battlefront and Palo Parente's dust studios to uh, you know really bring out an awesome product. Okay. And um, well, look, so we've, got, so we've got a couple of questions from people here. There's a question there: yeah. Do you find you do a lot of collaborations, or are you thinking of doing more based on your 1843 experience? I don't know what 1843, but um, oh, I, I mentioned about 80, 1843, which Paolo Parente did. Um, and so having done the crossover with Dust, we did a crossover with Godlike as a book uh, for a yeah. acting crossover with Interface, uh, Interface 2.0 called Interface 19.40. And so that's all coming out as part of the acting Cthulhu range. And I found that collaborations work really well because it's when you both have exciting worlds, uh, for example, and you can bring your uh, you can bring a new product out that appeals to both audiences, so you both win. And uh, often fans, you know, Dust and Acting Cthulhu is a great crossover. You know, you could argue that we're both competitors, but it's such a small industry, and we all love each other's games, and it's just it's just fun to do stuff like this. I play Dust, you know, so and Paolo Parente loves Acting Cthulhu, so it was a great it was a great team up. Now, um, you know, we're also doing a lot of work with Spartan Games and, um, you know, so we've done the deal for them to develop our, our um, Acting Cthulhu skirmish game because we're not a, a miniatures company, we're a role-playing games company, we're developing board games next um, and we're working closely with them on miniatures games, but we don't have a warehouse full of miniatures, you know, we have an office and people around the world who are writers and um, so it makes sense to work with people who know what they're doing. Now we've got lots of other collaborations in the works where other people have got great worlds um, that haven't yet been made into role-playing games. So there's collaborations that we're going to be announcing over the next um, couple of months actually, where we're going to be announcing the official role-playing game of their their world, and uh, which makes complete sense. Like, have you got a set role-playing system, like set of rules that you use for all these these games? Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, we've been developing a new system with Jay Little, who's the designer of the Star Wars role-playing game, Edge of the Empire. So that system, um, which at the moment is called the 2D20 system, uh, I need for want of a better name, uh, but it uses 2D20, so it kind of makes sense. And that um, is becoming our house system. We've got a different system for dust, which uses the dust dice, which is slightly different kind of D6s. 
Um, but going forward, all our big games are going to be using our house system. And it's, um, it's got John Dunn working on it. He did all the talents and skills for Star Wars. It's got Jason Mark, who did all the spaceships and gear. Uh, Nathan Dowdell, who also works on a lot of fancy flight game stuff. So we've got a really strong writing team. And um, I'm either overseeing it to kind of really ensure we get a um, you know, very cinematic, fun role-playing game that um, doesn't feel boring after four hours. <laughs> so it's still easy to play. You know. Is it kind of like a very loosely ruled game, or is it, you know, or is it still crunchy? I mean, you know, it's not just. I mean, it's got hit locations, for example, but it's oh. got narrative stuff like like fate points. It's got chronicle points. Um, it's got uh, a stripped down skill list. It's um, it has action, you know, you get success spends from um, achieving various numbers of successes when you roll a task. And the, the GM has this thing called the symmetry pool, which is a pool of dice or points that he uses to activate his NPCs and do cool stuff. So um, it's got, you know, ideas from different games. It's, it's nothing, it, we've not created anything. Oh my God, this is the game that's going to change the world. It's just lots of great ideas. Put together, and uh, we hope will be a more cinematic system than has been before, uh, and certainly seems to work for everything we're doing at the moment. Yeah, I think it's it's funny you mentioned this kind of dice pool because um, I've been speaking to a few other publishers over in America who've got some kind of new systems, and it seems the the trend at the moment is kind of like to give some of the narrative and some of the, the actual gameplay back to the players during the session. You know, it, it, you know, the old school times, you have your GM, he dictates what's going on, and that's it. But now a lot of these rules coming out seem to be where it's kind of like the players lead the narration somewhat. So there might be like a dice pool that the GM gives for doing something crappy against the players that they can then utilise to change the way the scenario works. And there seems to be a lot oh, of yeah, systems I'm out there doing that. There are. Yeah, there are games where, you know, you even don't have a GM or the GM role moves around, which is a lot more narrative. We're, I'm still from the school of, I don't like multimedia films where you get to choose what happens because when I realise the bum's hurting in the cinema, I, it's a rubbish film because I'm out, I'm not in the film anymore. And um, I don't want to have to press a button and I don't, I don't want to have to make up the story I like being part of helping creating the story, but as a player, I don't want to be, I want, to, I want someone to help tell a story to me. And so, our, you know, our, the, our system is, um, it's, still, it's still the GM is in control, he's leading you on this fantastic storyline, and you are collaborating and helping to, 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 to create that. And the, the Chronicle points let you do things like fake points. So they let you say, Okay, I'm going to pay a fake point or a chronicle point. I've probably got my shotgun in the back of the car, think, thinking it would, we're going to be into trouble. Or there's probably a toolkit in this um, engineering room, you know, it's sort of things like that. So they also yeah, yeah. let you do really cool cinema, cinematic actions as well. So. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. So we've been talking about Action for Dulu, you've got your dust. We've got Mutant Chronicles. Anything else you want to talk about? Anything else that's coming out, out from um, you know from your from your uh, design studio, as you say? Oh wow, yes, good point. Um, that's a very good question. What can I talk about? There's uh, well, we've been there's, there's all sorts of stuff we're working on. We've got a, a board game called City of the Dead, which is uh, a zombie board game. Everyone has to have a zombie board game these days. <laughs> um, <laughs> ours is kind of set the night before everything all hell breaks loose literally and you still have a chance to save the city and it's really down to you whether you follow your own goal you know to get your brother to get your daughter to get your dad or whatever and get out of dodge or whether you work together with the other players to find out the secret of the zombies find out where they're spawning and find out the um how to defeat them and you can do that so it's, together it's kind of like a one well, is it i mean because i know a lot of the board games nowadays the change the way so that the players and the poor working together against the board rather than being an individual. Is yeah. that the way? Uh, that's uh, the way I've been designing it at the moment. It's a co-op game, and you, you basically play against the zombies. But we might also do. Um, it, it's still at that stage where it could become a versus game. Um, I still like the idea of um, 
sometimes you can't, um, there's nothing like having a real player playing the bad guys. So, um, but it's really fun. It's a tile based game. So you build a city out of the tiles and you're moving around and you can control the police blockades, the national guard, um, but things are going from bad to worse. You know, things are collapsing. So you're losing control of, you know, the police blockades are collapsing. You can, you know, evacuate people from different city blocks to reduce the chances of zombies appearing. Uh, and we're also doing an acting. It tells us there's going to be some nice, nice miniatures in the board game as well. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, actually, I'm, at the moment, I'm using uh, meeples as uh, for the playtest because I love the idea of kind of doing this sort of cool little box set. Uh, but it could, they could well become miniatures as well, I think, they're little hordes of zombies. And, um, but we're also doing a big co-op game for Axe and Cthulhu as well. So it's somewhere between uh, Defenders of the Realm, if you know that kind of co-op pandemic style game, yeah. and uh, Axis and Allies. So it's a kind of uh, tactic, strategic battle across Europe with a, with a, a sort of um, a, uh, a cooperative element to, to to work together to fight the forces of, uh, well, the Nazis and Mythos. And you'll have a lot of armed units to move around and try and block the, uh, the bad guys. And it's a bit of a tactical choice. You know, are you gonna leave the 101st Airborne near, near um, the Ardennes for the uh, Battle of the Bulge, uh, where they're gonna be critical in helping to defeat the Nazis? Or are you gonna put them somewhere else. You're going to put them in Paris because that's going to, they're going to kick the ass of the, um, of the cultists, the, the Cthulhu cultists when they appear there. So it's, uh, you know, you've got to take some risks and, you know, um, you'll have like various big armoured, you know, or infantry units and, and special forces that, that you can either put them in their historical locations or, uh, or put them somewhere else and then you've got to no, Odysseus definitely seems to be going down the route of the, the World War Two action. I mean, by the looks of it. I mean, is that is that a cunning plan you've made? Because obviously, I suppose the fact that a lot of these board games and these systems, these settings, are based around sort of World War Two. I suppose you can, if you've got a piece of art from one system, you think actually we can't use it there. It's probably quite easy yeah. to move it across to another system. Yeah, yeah. Once you've got all the artwork, it's easy to to move it around. And also, you know, we've got this great story acts in Cthulhu and so we want to use it more and more and, and not just suddenly start doing 20 other different worlds and games. Um, so Mutant Chronicles is obviously a big game for us, Dust is, and uh, Acts in Cthulhu is obviously our own game, it's not a license from someone else. And so we're, you know, we're already doing another game that was also kickstarted uh, last year, which is the Heroes of Normandy board game. We've got the Shadows of Normandy expansion with them, which is a standalone Kind of tactical battle game uh, based on Acton Cthulhu, and um, you know we're, going to, we're looking at doing a, a sort of simple card game around Acton Cthulhu. We're looking at a graphic novel at the moment, and uh, you know really trying to expand the world. So if you're a fan, you've got loads more ways of experiencing it. Obviously, the skirmish game when it comes out um, is going to bring another added value. We've got loads of really cool tiles that we plan to print more of. So potentially there'll be a tile-based miniatures game. Uh, using the same rules that will, you know, will come out later on. So we're, uh, you know, really thinking about how we how we grow the world. And there's lots more adventures and books that weren't funded by Kickstarter that will be coming next year. So you know, including it's a really, it gets me very excited because obviously I'm a fellow Brit, and it's just nice to see a British company, you know, that's putting so much effort into board games and role playing games and these settings. You know, because we haven't got a lot of that there. I mean, for years, everything was dominated by Games Workshop, which, you know, now is just, it's for the kids as far as I'm concerned. You know, I mean, I'm, you know, I, I fell out with Games Workshop in the, in, the, in the early 80s when they stopped, you know, when they stopped doing the role-playing games, you know. So it's really interesting to see that, you know, Modiphius is, is by the sounds of it, Chris, is, is really going to be an up-and-coming, potentially one of the big major players within the UK. I mean, you know, by the, by, by the sounds of stuff you're doing. Well, we're, yeah, we're trying hard. Um, it's, you know, we've got a long way to grow yet. And um, we're just, you know, expanding a bit at the moment, getting some more people involved in the business to, you know, because it's a small team. We've kept it small, so it doesn't spend a lot of money. And, um, you know, it's, it's always hard to grow from that couple of games to the next level where you can, you know, do four, five, six games. And, um, you know, we, we work from home, this little 
office here and uh, there's like two or three of us here and then various people that work online who are freelancers with us around the world and uh, you know, it's like um, I suppose that the good thing is because you've actually got a background outside of the hobby you know that you know that's probably why it will work because unfortunately a lot of times it's a lot a lot of games players who've not got that business acumen and that experience try and form a role-playing or board game business and they, and they fall the wayside yeah no that's true it's i mean it's, it's like that with a lot of industries you get people who come into it for the love of it and um you know and some succeed and and, and manage to learn from the lessons and others others don't it's the same thing with shops you get a lot of shops closed and, pe and people go oh all the gaming shops are closing but all the all the clothing shops are shutting and all the gate all the video game shops are shutting it's not just our industry and it's it typically it's the ones that aren't very good at merchandising and displaying the products and aren't very friendly and don't get the customer service right and don't get an online presence um, there's always a reason why shops tend to close it's the ones that are much more creative and competitive work hard and it's the same thing with businesses you've you know you've got to think okay if we make a piece of art, how many different games can we put it in? You know, can we put it in a card game? Can we put it in a board game? You know, that's something you, you brought up, which is very interesting. It's when you make that investment as a, as a small business, you want it to, to pay off and um, you don't want to be constantly reinventing the wheel. I mean, a good example is um, the Duff, you know, role playing system is, you know, we were discussing, do we, um, do we use our new system for it? Do we use the existing system? Because, Everyone thinks, oh, I've got this great idea for a system. This is how you'll roll the dice. Now, that's all very well. That's simple. But how are you going to do spaceship combat? How are you going to do brawling? How are you going to spend money in your world? How are you going to do character generation? How are you going to drive vehicles? How are you going to create spaceships? So how are you going to um, stat out characters? There's a million things you've got. Um, there's 200, 300 pages of rule books still to write once you've figured out your cool dice mechanic which we all love doing <laughs> uh, for games. And um, it's nine months of work. And, uh, you know, we've gone through um, 10 play test versions and hundreds of people play testing and, um, I don't know, six, seven major surveys and analyzing it and looking at the responses and discussing it and discussing it. And these things take time. And uh, when you're doing that, you're not doing something else, which is earning money for the business. and uh, there's real balance. Yeah. You've got to think, everyone loves designing new games, but sometimes you have to go, this is the game we're going to use now. And yeah, maybe there could be a better system, but we can make this system work for it. And as a small business, you've got to make some calls on, let's, you know, let's make this, let's get the games out. Let's not spend another two years working on another game idea. Um, let's get these games out and, um, you know, make some money and then we can do more fun stuff. And um, and to be honest, I mean, the, that has been better. The amount of the amount of money that you know the the, the backer uh, pledge levels you got from um, you know from your Kickstarter, and you you know I mean that that must that must have been a, a, a relief, and it must have been something which you've used utilized probably somewhat to to sort of develop these other systems you're thinking about, or is it something that you know is all being plugged back into that into that setting? We've been uh, I've been really careful actually because I've seen other businesses. Um, before you know use money that's sitting in the bank uh, from a sale for something else and I've, we've been really really careful not to go oh let's go to lots of conventions and let's you know um build a massive new website and uh and an airplane an air ticket and things like that yeah. yeah um you know i'm at the moment we're you know i don't think we've got a stand at gen con so i'm not thinking of going and it's you know it's, it's three thousand dollars um Just and uh, that can be better spent making a new Mutant Chronicles book, which we can sell, to be honest. But are and, you going uh, to have a presence at, say, the British cons, like Dragon Meat and, and anything else uh, that might be on the... Yeah, yeah. We'll have some kind of presence at, at, at Gen Con, regardless. Someone will be selling our books. But, um, you know, if we can't get a stand, I don't want to waste money just being there. Uh, it's obviously lovely to be there, but I'm, I'm, very, I'm very conscious about money. You know, I'm very conscious about the fact that a lot of people gave us a lot of money to get them those books. So until I've given them those books, I don't think that money belongs to us. You know, I'm very sort of, um, you know, we're really oh, kind yeah. of frugal. And, 
and and try not to go a bit too crazy spending money and um you know there's there's a balance because you, you know that if you pay for a book to be printed it will generate money uh, but what you've got to be careful about is not throwing money at loads of cool ideas it's very tempting to think you've got lots of cash oh well you know we're like fancy flight now let's develop 10 new board games and and uh yeah. suddenly you're in debt you know because all this stuff costs money and you it, it's we're building it the business slowly and um you know showing that we can deliver what we we've been paid for and then people will give us more trust you know going forward anything else you particularly want to talk about anything you want to promote or um anything at all chris i think that's it we are doing a big charity project soon we're raising money for um uh, a group called vision rescue which by the time this comes out we uh, we might have launched it's um uh, Medicius is you kind of we try and get involved in charitable projects and our, our commitment's been to support a a school bus in Mumbai that goes okay. into the uh, part of the slums and they they go to like three stops in the day and um, feed the kids and school them and uh, so we're we're raising twenty thousand dollars for a new bus um, so we're getting loads of our friends in the games companies to put a big PDF package together and we're going to do a little Indiegogo fundraiser and um, try and see if we can raise money for a new bus and there's, there's some big announcements coming in the next kind of month um, six weeks but uh, about some new games and a, and a big event as well find out more about um, Chris's, um, Chris's brand and these exciting games that we've just been discussing then you can head over to www.modifius which is m-o-d-i-p-h-i-u-s dot com uh, and there you'll see some of the lovely artworks and these fantastic figures. And uh, well, I'm very, I mean, I'm very excited, Chris. I mean, looking, you know, looking, looking at your website, you know, I, if if just ten percent of what what's happened there comes off, mate, then I think you know you're onto a winner. You know, it's uh, it looks it looks fantastic. You know, and I'm and I'm saying that quite selfishly as a Brit. So it's you know, to my mind, it's uh, you know, it's, it's stuff which I'll definitely be playing and getting my hands on. Um, well. You know, I'd like I'd like to thank Chris for uh, joining us tonight. Um, uh, any last thoughts, Chris? Anything you want to chat about before we before we stop? No, that's all good. My uh, my wife's waiting for me to. We're going running tonight <laughs> in the in the oh. in the nighttime air of London. It's um, with neon lights, so it's going to be quite funny. Um, right, okay. So yeah, we're getting all excited and ready to get our running shoes on. But thanks for having us. And uh, love to come back at some point and uh, talk about some of our new new games. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's a very exciting thing we've got going on. I mean, obviously, guys, um, you know, th th this podcast has been hosted on behalf of Ethercom, which takes place on the uh, weekend of the 14th to the 16th of this year. Um, I don't know, Chris, have you, have you, are you planning to sort of host anything during the Ethercom weekend? Are we going to see a presence from your systems? Not talked about it yet, but I'm sure we'll be something, yeah. Yeah, that'd be good that'd be good well thanks everyone for watching um and listening um you know check out these links check out the kickstarter check out mutant chronicles third edition check out acts on cthulhu head over to uh, modifius.com uh, i'm sure you'll all be very impressed with the caliber of the of uh, the artwork the writing and and, uh, and what's what's there for us for the future um my name's john gibbons i'd like to say thank you to everybody thank you to chris okay. and, we'll, and we'll see you guys later Thank you.